Would you remain standing for the reading of God's Word? We are in Luke chapter 5, a famous story of Jesus and two boats. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret with the people crowding around him and listening to the Word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore, and then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Well, it's a pleasure to be here downtown. We are also broadcasting uh, to our West Campus and to around Houston today. So if I am on pixels, say I will say good morning to you as well. We are delighted that you're here. We're also talking to the source upstairs. So good morning to you guys. We are delighted that you're here in Worship Live with us. As I'm starting a new series called True North about staying on course, and I'm going to talk today about some ways we're on course and some ways I think we're off course. And the good news is if we're on course, we can stay on course. Amen? And the good news is, is that we are, if we are off course, we can change course. All God's people said, Amen. all right, I'm going to remind you that you said that enthusiastically. You got it? Well, I've been visiting with our congregation, I got to tell you, uh, just, just in a personal way, how much I love our church. I've only been here a month, and uh, it feels like it's been uh, longer because of the pleasantness of our conversation, not because it's dreary. Um, our church is just varied, and we go from one end of Houston to the other, and then through uh, media and TV and streaming uh, nationwide, and so it's just kind of exciting Uh, to get to know you guys, and today's sermon comes from what I've heard from you. Um, I'm in the midst of these congregational visits. I've got, I think, 17 or 18 done. I've got like 67 others to go, (laughs) so I'm a little tired, but it's been such a joy to get to know you guys, and you know, the Lord just provides, I think, symbols along the way, and we're in this series called True North, which of course is a compass, and I was visiting with a guy named John Esquivel, who's a leader in our church out west, and with the sinners out at West Chase, and, and uh, that was a joke, but I'll just move on, because apparently <laughs> that wasn't real funny here. Um, but John is a great Christian guy, and he, he was the ethics and compliance officer for his corporation, and he said to me, Andy, I always kept a compass on my desk, just a small one, just you know, right here, and it always pointed true north, and whenever I had to make a tough decision, I looked at it. And today, my daughter has the same compass on her desk, and as we were eating Mexican food at Irma's, having this conversation, which, if you want me to pray for you, take me out to lunch. It's amazing how I always remember people who have fed me. That was funnier. That's helpful. Okay. <laughs> he, said, he said, I always had that compass, and my daughter does today on her desk, you know, and it's just a reminder of how to make a decision. And we need that. We need that. As human beings, we're all over the map. I'm no 
uh, different than you in that regards. My wife is here. She'll attest to that. And we need, we need a compass. We need a true north. And that, before I say anything else, is who Jesus is. He is our way. And so as human beings and as congregations and even as people and nations and things like that, we need somebody who sets the standard for us about what the true direction is. And for us, that's Jesus. And with human beings that can be as amazing as what we see in the Olympic uh, games that are currently going on, or even to our most sinful decisions that are evil worse, we see what's possible when we stay true north, when we make a decision that goes in a better direction. And so I'm praying that that's what today is. So there are three things that you have told me your senior pastor needs to be about as senior pastor of our church, and they are the following. This comes from you. Financial stability and transparency, community, small groups, and Sunday school classes, and missions, season everything we do to reach those in need. Financial stability and transparency, community, the relentless invitation to drive people into small groups and Sunday school classes, of which we have many, many, and then missions, that, that desire that seasons our hearts and our church to serve those in need. Of those three, money, community, and missions, which one would you like for me to talk about today? Thank you, I'll choose money, good. <laughs> I wanna to talk to you about the financial practices of our church, and, and again, I mean, it's, 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 it's sort of a good news, bad news story. We, we have a very generous church. We really do. We've had a very generous church for a very long time. And that will not change. Our hearts are in a place where we understand what it is to give. We have some practices, though, that I just want to say as senior pastor of the church, I'm thinking about trying to change. Now, you know, as senior pastor, I'm not a dictator. I don't have all authority. You all have a finance committee and a pastor parish relations committee, and I'm, I'm subject to what they want to do even when they are at their sinful worst. So, you know, but I, I want us to be transparent. I want us to be, especially when it comes to money, just a glass house that you can look all the way through and from one end to the other, from top to bottom. When you give to your church, I want you to know what it does. And so if you have any question ever about what you give and where it goes, please let me know, because transparency, I think, is vital to us. And we've done, done some things that I think I just question whether they're just really smart for us. Like one is we stop sending out monthly giving statements to our members. We don't send a monthly statement. We stopped a few months ago, and there was not a groundswell of just you all saying to us, please, please start sending those monthly statements again. But here's what I know. That's a good way to get folks not to give to their church, isn't it? I mean, every other entity that I, you know, I remember I gave to a political candidate years ago, 30 years ago, and he still sends me a giving statement every year about what I've given to his campaign. I only gave like five bucks, and he spent more than that in postage, but he still sends to me because I'm on the list. And so we're going to resume that. We're going to resume giving those giving statements coming to you. Please read what they say and be generous. We're also going to, we've also done a thing that's gotten us in a bit of trouble and that we've relied on what we call around here non-covenant giving. And what that is, is um, we budget for growth, but then also for families that don't turn in a pledge card to us, we pledge what we think they might give. And that's wonderful if, if, if that giving happens, but if that giving doesn't happen, the church is in a bit of a pinch and that's where we find ourselves today. So what I'm going to tell you is, in 2017, I'm going to come to our finance committee, and you know, I'm on, I've got this really cool sheriff's badge, you know, and I'm going to borrow a belt and holsters from Charles Thompson, because I think he's got a pair. He hasn't told me that, but I'm, if anybody's got holsters in this place, it's Charles Thompson. <laughs> you know, and I'm going to come in and say, okay, I'm the new sheriff in town, and I've got a suggestion on how we ought to run this church, and here it is. We will budget only 
on what you tell us in writing that you will give. We will not budget for a penny more. We will not budget for a penny less. We're not a bank. We're not here to save the money. We are here to put it to work. That is what we are here to do as the church. But we're going to practice sound stewardship. And so this non-covenant giving is something that I think we have to take a second look at and say, you know what? We're not going to do this anymore. Now, I know the millennials up in the source are going, oh my gosh, writing on paper what I'm going to do? I'm breaking out in a rash. Don't worry, it'll be online, okay? Have the same effect. But you see, and this is where I would just ask you to kind of have a a one-on-one with Jesus, is that, you know, I find people who plan and people who write down what they're going to do, they're more generous. People who are intentional about what they want to do with their resources to build the kingdom are more generous. The phrase I like to use for us both inside the house and for maybe your house as well is to say First Methodist Houston really needs to become a more practicer of a more disciplined generosity in what we do inside the operation and in what we do in individual members' homes. So I'm going to ask you to take a look at what you're giving, and if you can take a step towards a truer north, we need it. So here's, here's kind of where we are. Um, and again, this is, this is not my first choice in what to talk about, but um, none of our dreams and hopes come true until we are financially stable and transparent. So we need, as a church, about in the next six months, a million dollar move to the good. That's a lot of money. So I'm going to pause here for dramatic effect and let that sink in. We need over the next six months, about a million dollar move to the good for our ministries to flourish and for our congregation to be in a place of financial stability moving into the 2017 that will be ahead. Now, that is a lot of money, but we are a significant congregation, and I kind of want to walk through it with you because I think it's a challenge we could meet. Now, in good conscience, I also have to say that if we do not see this over the next 6, 8, 12 weeks, you are going to witness and experience, experience a significant contraction in the ministries to which you are accustomed. That's just where it is. If we do not see this in the next few weeks, you are going to experience a significant reduction in the ministries to which you are accustomed. I would rather not go down that road. I will if it is necessary because ultimately we have to be a place that, you know, is sustainable with the resources we have to operate with. I understand that. But I would also like to outline to you what is possible and maybe a more preferable road. So a million dollars. This is where the fundraiser in me kicks in. Okay, I got a million dollar mountain to climb. How do I do it? Well, I looked at our budget and I immediately cut the lobster and steak for the pastor lunches every Tuesday at noon. (laughs) No, we don't do those. I looked at our budget, and we had some areas that we could trim, honestly, because we were inefficient. I tell our church staff, we have to be effective, we have to be efficient, and we have to get results. All three, that's the holy trinity of church performance. Effective, efficient, get results. So I looked at our budget, and we've cut $105,000 off of our budget that I do not believe will significantly impact our ministries at all. I have my eye on another 100 ready to go. So I believe that over the next few weeks, we can cut from the annual budget about a quarter of a million dollars to get us a step of the way there. So that leaves us $750,000 to think about over the next six months in additional giving. How do we do that? Well, let's talk. We have 823 households that financially pledge to this church. 823. I wrote it down. 823. If I take 750,000 and divide it by 823, that's $911.30. $911.30 
gets us where, to a place where by giving household over the next six months, we will have financial stability and transparency and the ministries to which we are accustomed. So $911 over the next six months, 823 households. If I divide that by six months, that's 26 weeks, give or take, right? So $911 divided by 26 is $35.05. $35.05 per household per week in additional giving beyond which we've seen today. If I say a household is two people, okay, you know, on average, $35.05 divided by two is $17.52 roughly. So here's the deal. If we see from people who are giving to us currently a rise of $17.50 per person per week, we will end the year financially stable and completely transparent. Thank you. We've got one household committed. We just need 822 more. I appreciate the gesture. Well, that's less than a movie if it's 3D, you know? And some people, and I want to be sensitive to this, we have everything in this church from the widow's might. I want to respect that. I met some people last week or two weeks ago at the source from the local halfway house. I don't want them to tithe. I do eventually, you know, but not initially. We have also people in our church who've been blessed financially, and they understand, and they have demonstrated a huge track record in our church of understanding that to more is given, more is expected, and they have been unbelievable to this church. But most of us probably are somewhere in between, you know? And so 17 bucks for many of us would be a step towards a truer north. And let's be honest, it would move our heart in a place where we would be living out more the generosity Jesus hopes for us. And so would you take this chance to take a step forward and give? I want you to know that Deborah and I are in. I did get paid by our church the other day. And yeah, I know it's always a good thing. I have to eat too. And 10% of that check went to First Methodist Church of Houston. We're delighted to be in there with you. So when you come to me and say, we're not getting our money's worth out of this ministry, I feel that too, okay? In that it's important to us that the church have the resources it needs to thrive. So what I'd like you to do is talk about this in your family, talk about this in your Sunday school classes, talk about this in your small groups, but if you would take ownership of it, it could really put us in a drastically different place. Tuesday, I'm going to be sending out an email, as I will be every Tuesday, to all the members and, and friends of our church, and again, I'm just going to outline what I've told you this morning. But I believe that if we all step forward together and be the body of Christ that Paul, or, you know, Paul talked about and Jesus certainly intended us to be, that we should have all the resources we need to be the church Jesus Christ is calling us to be today. So with that, I just kind of want to throw you with a, or end with a, a scripture and a dream. You know, in our story uh, from the scriptures today, Jesus was um, fishing. And, and there's a conversation with Peter about how, you know, where Peter says to Jesus, look, Jesus, we've been working hard all night long and haven't gotten much result. And, and then Jesus kind of says to him, you know, well, if you just throw out in deeper water, it's going to be different. And Peter does that, and they take in such a haul that they have to call the second b boat over, and there's such a catch of fish that both boats actually are in danger of, of sinking. It's easy for us to see the parallel today. If we throw ourselves in a little bit deeper water, if we sacrifice just to a little bit greater degree, the prospect of what could happen for us is amazing. I know that a flourishing First Methodist Church Houston 
will be a place that Jesus sends people in abundance. I've already seen that happen. In fact, I preached a financial sermon at 845, and we actually had somebody join on a stewardship message. What a work of God that is. I know that there is a day of abundance that's before us. If we step into this together, we will experience the same phenomena the disciples knew. When we throw ourselves into a little bit deeper water, the catch is rich. And if we do that today, over the rest of the summer, towards the end of this year, the ministries that we see will be fantastic. The promise I will make to you as your senior pastor is, is that in six months, you're going to have a church that you're tremendously excited about, and in 12 months, you're going to be ecstatic about what the Lord has done. So let's pray, let's talk, let's see what can happen together, but if we all take a step towards true north today, I know that the harvest, the catch, whatever metaphor you choose to use, will be a blessing for us all. Join me as we pray. Thank you. Gracious God, we are grateful for this chance to be your church, for the chance to speak plainly and openly, we pray, about the business that we need to be about. Help us to understand, Lord, though, that ministry always comes first, that ultimately we are a, a table of friends we are a body of Christ that's made up of people, of hearts and minds and souls that have put our trust in you. Help us to continue to be this church that puts the heart, the mind, and the soul first and understands that with our priorities and with our lives more reflecting you, by taking a step in a northerly direction, we will be a church that experiences the blessings and the abundance of which your scripture speaks. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and as God's people to church, we respond by saying together, amen.